playing in I'm not paying attention to your silly tuning issues. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise right out of the ground. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. What do you think I see? I see a band of angels and they're coming after me. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, look down yonder, Gabriel. On the land and sea. But Gabriel, don't you blow your trumpet till you hear it from me. Cause there ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Meet me, Jesus, meet me. In the middle of the air, and if these wings don't fail me, Lord, I'll meet you anywhere. Cause there ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, meet me, mother and father. Down the river road. And mama, you know that I'll be there when I check in my load. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no There ain't no grave that's holding his body down. He is risen, right? Yes. Sorry, I confused you all with that one. I put too many words in there. <laughs> Welcome to Rolling Hills Church. I'm Pastor Matt Wonderland. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad you're able to join us here on Resurrection Sunday. Our purpose here at Rolling Hills Church is to know God and to make God known. And one of the ways that we can help you with this is through the free gift that we have on the screen. If you text guest to that number, you'll receive a subscription to Right Now Media, and that's just our gift to you for coming here today. So this will be scrolling after the service as well, but I do encourage you to do that because it is a fantastic resource. There is one announcement on the screen, but there are kind of a couple of things going on. The announcement on the screen is a reminder that this Friday, April 5th, is our first Friday fellowship. So at 5.30, we'll be meeting here at the church to have a meal. And for the sake of simplicity, we're just asking people to bring their own food. And uh, instead of doing it more of a potluck style, we'll just have people bring their own food. And then after, you know, an hour or so, there'll be some music and prayer time and just a, a time of worship for us to be together. So we do hope you'll be able to join us on Friday. Also, just letting everyone know that we are having the affirmation next weekend. So for those who are members, we're voting on having the Spanish intern, Charlie and Ines, to come and uh, help us with our Spanish ministry here. So if you have any questions about them, please let me know, and I'll be happy to answer any of those questions. And now I'm going to turn it over for the Apologetics Minute.
get the right one here. Good morning. Some people reject the resurrection because it is a miracle. And according to them, supernatural miracles are not possible. If someone says a miracle is not possible, that is just another way of saying God does not exist. The possibility of miracles depends on whether or not God exists. If God exists, supernatural miracles like the resurrection are possible because the supernatural exists. If God does not exist, the natural world is all there is. And supernatural miracles are therefore impossible by definition. If someone says to you that miracles aren't possible, you should immediately recognize that such a statement assumes God doesn't exist. Of course, we must then be able to share the evidence for God's existence. In past years, we have presented apologetics minutes that give great evidence for the resurrection and also for the existence of God. But today I want to talk about one other evidence for the resurrection. Changed lives. If someone, excuse me, Jesus' disciples changed. There is a virtual consensus among scholars who study Jesus' resurrection that after his death by crucifixion, his disciples really believed that he appeared to them risen from the dead. They themselves claimed that the risen Jesus had appeared to them. And after his death by crucifixion, his disciples were radically transformed from fearful, cowering individuals who denied and abandoned him at his arrest and execution into bold proclaimers of the gospel. Paul changed. Paul heavily persecuted the early church, but everything changed when he encountered who he claimed was the risen Jesus in Acts 9. After that experience, he converted to the Christian faith and tirelessly preached Jesus' resurrection, eventually being martyred for his claims. James the brother of Jesus changed. James was not a believer in Jesus during his ministry as both Mark and John describe. However, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says Jesus appeared to James and after that, James was described as a leader of the church in Acts and Galatians. He too was martyred for his faith. You and I changed. 2 Corinthians tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. If God has saved you, your life, and your whole perspective on life has changed. One of the most effective apologetic And evangelistic methods is one person telling another person and showing them through their actions how Jesus has radically changed their life. So let this this Easter inspire us to talk about our changed lives and to shine our light before others so they may see our good deeds and give God the credit and the glory. Good morning, church. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Today's passage is Luke 24, 36 through 49. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. 
and he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You may be seated. Up next is prayer time. Let's pray. Almighty God, the holy God who cannot be in the presence of anything contrary to yourself, who in your wisdom held back your hand of judgment, allowing your rebellious image bearers to compound the evil against you and fill up your cup of wrath. You put up with all that evil because you decided to love and reconcile some back to yourself in order to magnify your glory. The God-sized sentence of judgment that everyone has can only be paid by the God-man, that is, Jesus Christ, your Son, who came to this earth as a man and walked blameless before you, then was beaten beyond recognition, nailed to the cross, exposed for all to see, enduring excruciating pain, every time he lifted himself to breathe. Then he died, paying our sin debt to you and making peace between you and us through the blood of the cross. Now we celebrate that Jesus is risen from the dead and sits as king and high priest at your right hand. Every Sunday is an Easter reminder of what Savior has done and endured for us. We have a lot to praise and thank you for, starting with the grace and forgiveness you have offered to mankind. Praising and thanking you is something we don't do enough to our detriment. How can we complain about a bad day when Christ had a substantially worse day in order to save us from hell, to bring us into an eternity before you. How can we be angry with the pesky driver ahead when we remember you take care and feed the birds of the air, how much more valuable we are, and the probability that there is a lost soul driving that car. Our hearts should break for that person then when we look at you, God, your amazing character and attributes revealed through the Bible, showing us how divine and holy you are, our comprehension of you doesn't come close to the reality of how much grander you are, leaving us in humble awe before you. Praise God. Lord, we remember and pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. We pray for the work you are doing in Senegal and the hearts you are transforming. Please be with the missions team as they go over in a couple weeks. Lord, please bend our hearts towards compassion for our neighbors to share the good news of the gospel. With that, we lift up the affirmation next week for inviting Charlie and his wife to intern for the summer, focusing on Spanish ministry. May we glorify and praise you through the remainder of this service. Amen.
Amen. Well, my name is Lauren Montgomery. I'm the music leader here at Rolling Hills Church. Stand with me, if you will. Let's worship the Lord together. Yeah. 
bright shining as the sun. We know less days to sing your praise, and when we first
Amen. You may be seated. So for those of you who may be um, visiting, um, you know, for those of you who might not be regular attenders, um, something that we do here every um, week is, or every month, I should say, we do a memory verse. Because if you've ever had a song stuck in your head, you know it's hard to get a song stuck in your head out of your head sometimes. So we take pieces of scripture and we put it to music with the idea being that hopefully some of these songs get stuck in your head. Because any of the kids want to tell me where's the only Bible that you actually own? Where is it? Yeah, the one in your head. That's the only Bible that you actually own is the one that you have memorized. So this is our memory verse for the month of March. Here we go. First John. Chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I write these things. Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. John chapter 5 verse 13. We say here at Rolling Hills that community only becomes reality through intentionality. So let's take a moment to be intentional and say hello to the folks around us. Okay, please begin finding your way back to your seats. It's great to be a part of a church family where we love one another.
At first, people made fun of Louis Pasteur. After all, it was the mid-1800s, the height of the Enlightenment and of the Industrial Revolution, and everyone knew that it was foul air that caused disease. But instead, Pasteur had this crazy idea that these little things that you can't even see, called germs, were actually the culprits. Experts ridiculed Pasteur and they ostracized the young chemist. Doctors called his theory a ridiculous fiction. University professors called it a perfect distillation of nonsense. Fellow scientists said it was hardly ingenious enough for us to waste further time upon. The man is a joke and these bacterial phantoms will soon be forgotten. But Pasteur didn't give up. Despite doubt, he sought truth out. And he kept doing his experiments. Slowly but surely, Pasteur's findings became too strong to deny. After decades, people finally accepted that it was germs that caused disease, not foul air. This led to the creation of many vaccines and ultimately saved countless lives. And so at the end of his life, far from being ridiculed, Louis Pasteur was celebrated as a hero. He showed that if you passionately pursue the truth through smart investigation, you will achieve great success, even if everyone in the world disagrees. As Christians, it can sometimes feel like the whole world disagrees. Even some so-called churches will cast doubt upon the scriptures. Is it really God's word? It is. 2 Timothy 3.16, we hear, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And I would imagine if you're here in this room today, I can probably say your doubts are at least small enough where you still generally believe the Bible and probably have a high view of Jesus. Most of us are still Christians, even if we have occasional doubts. But what happens when the doubts fester? When our doubts fester, they can start to blossom and consume us, and we become ineffective Christians. We're still Christians, we're just ineffective. It's because we're not all in when we start to doubt. When we doubt, we, we hold back our time and money. We people please instead of evangelize, and we prioritize worldly things over God's things. We're still Christians, but we're ineffective Christians. And I got to say, I think the devil's okay with that. Other people's doubts have a way of creeping in, don't they? But today we're not going to spend much time on other people's doubts because despite all the evidence, unless the Holy Spirit changes their hearts, they won't believe. Because it's not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. People often try to justify heart problems with intellectual answers and by being intellectually dishonest. We see in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But again, today's passage, Luke 24, 36-49, is about us as believers and when we doubt. And its value is to us is rooted in the Easter promise that when our faith starts to waver, Christ will reveal himself to us as we seek his truth. After all, we're not Muslims. I don't know if you know this, but in the Islamic faith, you are not allowed to ask questions. We're Christians. We want the questions. Because the Bible is true and Jesus is real, our faith can handle the skepticism. But we still must seek the truth amid our doubts. This passage invites us to envision a future where doubt gives way to faith and fear yields to peace and uncertainty is replaced by a steadfastness 
knowing that the Lord's presence is in our lives. My friends, don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. In verse 36, Jesus suddenly appears among the disciples. This is later on uh, Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, and the disciples are trying to figure out what's going on. So you can imagine their astonishment and their confusion as they grapple with the reality of Jesus standing right there. How would you feel if someone that you believed was dead suddenly appeared before you? This moment would have challenged their understanding of reality. And it would have certainly confronted their doubt about what other people were claiming they had seen. And Jesus' greeting of peace to you is an attempt to offer reassurance and comfort amid their fear. And when we encounter unexpected or unsettling situations in our lives, we're called to call on Jesus' presence and recognize that it will bring peace and calm to our troubled hearts, even when things don't make a lot of sense to us. Listen, too, to the words of Jesus in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As we think about this verse, let's consider how do we respond to those unexpected moments in life? Do we allow fear to paralyze us? Or do we trust Jesus' presence and find peace? Verse 37 perfectly describes how I would feel if I was in that room, startled, <laughs> frightened, thinking I saw a ghost, right? And I got to be real, a dead person saying peace to you really wouldn't have brought me much peace. I don't know about you. In fact, it would make me realize, oh man, this is real. <laughs> and so initially, I think it would have created a little extra anxiety. But of course, Jesus doesn't leave us to those doubts and fears. Instead, in verse 38, Jesus gently confronts the disciples' unbelief. He invites them to engage with him in a deeper way. When fears and uncertainties weigh us down and hinder our faith, where do we go? Jesus is big enough to handle our fears and our doubts. And we see here he doesn't shy away from their doubts. Instead, he addresses them head on. And he'll meet us in our moments of doubt too. And he will patiently guide us towards the truth. And so we must heed Jesus' call to confront disbelief and seek the truth with open hearts and an open mind. Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. Jesus is, then works through their doubts beginning in verse 39. He invites them to touch his hands and his feet, demonstrating the physical reality of the resurrection. He's offering tangible proof that there is victory over death and this should dispel all their fears and uncertainties. As the disciples reach out to touch his scars, they're met with the presence of Christ. And we too are invited to explore the reality of his presence and the truth of his words. Jesus says in John 5.39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. The Bible holds all the answers to our doubt. We just have to read it. We just need to spend time studying it. Are we willing to search the scriptures, to reach out to him in prayer, and trust the research that millions of people who have come before us have done? Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. We read in verses 40 through 43 that he then eats broiled fish right in front of them after, again, showing his scars. Now, the disciples at this point, they must have been in emotional overdrive, right? It, it, it doesn't seem possible. And yet, it's real. Sometimes when I'm sharing the gospel with people, their response to me is, no, no. That's too good to be true. 
There isn't anything I have to do to go to heaven except believe in Jesus. It's too easy. It doesn't make sense. It's too easy. And yet, it's one of the most difficult things in the world to let go of trying to control my eternal destiny and fully trust what Jesus has done. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one will boast. I encourage people to seek the truth in Scripture, to put aside their preconceived notions about what the Bible says and what Christianity is all about, and just read what it says. Just read what it plainly says. So, for example, Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. No, no good works. No, your positive has to outweigh your negatives. Right? You're not on probation and hopefully if you do enough sacraments, you're going to get to go there. No, it says you will be saved. Not might. Not probably. You will. If you confess Jesus is Lord and believe what we're celebrating today on Easter Sunday. Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. In verses 44 through 45, Jesus opens the door to their understanding the Bible by revealing how his life and death and resurrection fulfilled the scriptures. He connects his earthly ministry with the overarching narrative of redemption found in the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I would have loved it if this was about 50 verses longer so that I could hear what Jesus would have said in this moment. I would have loved that. But of course then I wouldn't be able to discover it myself as I studied God's word. But just as Jesus illuminated the scripture for his disciples, he will continue to illuminate it for us. He will work through his Holy Spirit to help us see the reality of history when he came and rose from the dead. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to engage with scripture with an open mind and an open heart. Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. In verses 46 through 47 then, Jesus shows how being grounded in the truths of Scripture should next lead to action. Because, quite frankly, when our doubts are there, when they're festering within us, we can't be all in as Christians. We won't be effective as his witnesses to the world. And being his witness is our calling. That's our purpose. That's what gives life meaning. I mean, I've seen enough movies and I've read enough silly books to know that if someone comes back from the dead to tell me something, I should probably pay attention. Right? I should probably listen to what they're saying. Repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name is to be proclaimed to all the nations of the world. We are his witnesses, as verse 48 relates. A witness is simply someone who tells others what he or she has seen. Now, Jesus never came and ate fish in front of me. Probably not you either, I would guess. And I've never touched his hands but he's touched my life. And similarly to what the apologetics minute was talking about today, he changed me. I know who I was before I became a Christian, and I know who I am now. We do have eyewitness testimonies in the Bible. We do have historical proof, but we also know our personal stories. And we can share those stories, and these stories support the Bible. I have no doubt about my personal testimony. I was there. I have no doubt about how God continues to intervene in my life. And I have no doubt that the resurrection is real because Jesus made me alive. 
Jesus calls us to be witnesses of his resurrection and ambassadors of grace to a broken and hurting world. I've said before, all of us are kind of like spies. Every single one of us is disguised as a teacher, a construction worker, a farmer, or whatever your job is, you're incognito as one of Christ's witnesses. You are there because God has called you to that space. Are we willing to embrace our role in God's redemptive plan? And we don't have to do it alone because we read in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so besides being a witness where we are, we must also consider the possibility that we are called to go to one of the two billion people who live in places where they are unlikely to meet a follower of Jesus Christ? Are we willing to use our time and money to support people who bring the gospel to hopeless places? Places where this happened to Sierra and I when we were in India. If you ask them about Jesus, they will respond, he doesn't live in this village. Maybe he's in the next one. They have no hope. Let's not waste our lives here and now, nor miss our calling because we won't deal with festering doubts. Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. And again, we can be assured that the Holy Spirit goes with us. Verse 49 here looks just like what I just read in Acts 1.8. Jesus promises to clothe the disciples with power from on high to empower them for their mission. Now, keep in mind, this was a, that brief window of history where the resurrection had happened, but the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet, right? Pentecost hadn't quite happened. So they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit. But we don't. We don't have to wait. Ephesians 1.13 tells us, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When we believe, we've received the Holy Spirit. And so, we don't have to wait in the city. Now, of course, there are good ways and better ways to be a church planter or missionary. But the main point is that each one of us is clothed with power from on high so that we can be Christ's witnesses. Where he has us right now or where he calls us to be. Again, are we willing to embrace our role in his plan to proclaim his message to the world around us? Because think about this. If we're not willing to tell people about Jesus here, what makes us think we're going to go to a place like Senegal and tell people about Jesus? If our church doesn't reach our community, what makes us think our church is going to be equipping people to reach the world? The best missionary preparation until you're called somewhere else is to be a good Christian and a good church member right where you're at with what he has you currently doing. Our mission field is Grant County, Wisconsin, even as we have a heart for the two billion people who are lost and we support pursuing them. Let's have an outward focus and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to equip us and to guide us to reach others. Again, don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. As we conclude, this encounter between Jesus and his disciples, they profoundly reveals the nature of our faith. We see how seeking Jesus amid our doubts leads to reassurance and clarity. Like the disciples experienced the risen Lord's peace and wonder, we too can know his transformative power in our lives. Doubt does not need to hinder our faith. In fact, our doubts can be a motivator to dive deeper into the scriptures, to gain greater understanding, to work with the Holy Spirit and abide with him. And then, as we wholeheartedly seek the truth, we will be unfettered by doubt. 
and we will effectively pursue his missional call. And so here's the bottom line. This is what we all need to do. Whether you're currently experiencing doubt or not, get serious about spending time in God's Word. Read your Bibles. Explore His truth. I hesitate to say this because you'll hold me accountable, but today I started a 90-day plan to read the entire Bible. It's a lot of chapters every day. So I guess now I have to be held to it. But as you approach the scriptures, as you renew your vigor in studying God's word, be sure to make verse 45 a prayer. Lord, open my mind to understand the scriptures. The Bible is the only book where the author's right there with us. Jesus will reveal himself to you as you spend time in his word. Are you willing to be strengthened like Louis Pasteur? And despite all doubt, press onward despite the naysayers who lack accurate vision. Easter weekend is a great time to begin. Don't harbor doubt. Seek truth out. Let's pray. Almighty Lord, you are the source of all truth. You are the creator and sustainer of all things. You are amazing, awesome, and powerful. And you are also Emmanuel, God with us. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we are ineffective as your witnesses. Forgive us for the times when we let our doubts fester instead of pursuing the truth. Help us, Lord, to grow in our faith so that we can reach lost people and expand your kingdom for your glory. Lord, teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us insight into your word and to see what is plainly there and to accept its powerful truths. Lord, we are so thankful that you are with us. We're so thankful that you are patient with us. Lord, we ask now that you would just help us to continue to grow. In Christ's name, amen. Well, here at Rolling Hills Church on the last Sunday of the month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so I'm going to invite the brothers to come forward and distribute elements. And there is someone at the back door. Would be able to let them in, please? Um, as, there's, as they are distributing the elements, we're going to hold on to them, and we'll all partake of them together. And uh, the little white crackers, by the way, are gluten-free.
Today's passage for the institution of the Lord's Supper comes from Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 25. It says, And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Let's take now the bread together, remembering his body was broken for us. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Take now the cup, remembering Christ's covenant of grace. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your resurrection today, we are reminded of the painful cost that led to it. That you had to first come to earth, live among us in this fallen world, be without sin, face betrayal, mockery, loneliness, and then eventually beatings, crucifixion, and death. Forgive us, O Lord, for when we neglect so great a salvation and when we take for granted what you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to live lives of gratitude that overflow with love because of what you have done for us. Thank you for loving us first. Help us, Lord, not to leave these Uh, these four walls and forget everything but instead to live a life that is focused on you and one where we abide with you. Be with us this week. We thank you again for what you have done. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with me if you will. Joyful, joyful, we adore the God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. 
Amen. I'm going to conclude with John 20, verse 21. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Go forth in peace, and please know that you are loved. You are dismissed. Happy Easter. Try.